Before the Echo is brought to you by Exodus Outdoor Gear, Osseo Gear, and Stealth Outdoors. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Hope everybody's doing good tonight. Just so everybody knows, this is two shows in a row. I got notes. <laughs> I almost never take notes, Troy, and this, this week I've taken extensive notes on both shows. So right on. Who who <laughs> else was on? Who else was on? Me. I just did a solo one about uh oh. I, I just did a solo episode about um I don't know if you ever listened to the Joe Rogan experience, but Cameron Haynes and um steve ranella was on there and they got to talking about what will be the what will cause the end of hunting and they went over political issues you know infighting inside the hunting community yeah um, just the general uh, uh decreasing of hunting opportunity whether that be you know urbanization or uh you know farming practices now uh where you know farmers are getting rid of woodlots and things like that, public land getting sold off. Um, yeah. and I just talked about all the topics they talked about and kind of, um, went over things, um, and played that little two minute clip they did, but that's what it was about. It's pretty, cool. pretty, pretty interesting and pretty important topic, I guess. Oh, for sure. I, I, I listen to Joe and I'll have to catch that. I'll have to listen yeah. to it. Yeah. It was pretty good. Um, yeah, I think, whether you uh, agree with the whole Steve, or, you know, that, that click of, of people uh, in hunting, I know they get a lot of hate, but they are pretty important. They have a pretty big reach compared to the rest of the industry. Um, yeah. In fact, those three probably have a bigger reach than the whole other, if you can combine the whole industry together, <laughs> those three probably have more reach than everybody else combined. So. Um, yeah. Anyway. Ranella was, Ranella was talking to my son's college football team a month ago, a couple months ago. Oh, really? Yeah like a like a motivational thing or just like just a cool thing to have a, uh... the, the coaches had him in just because he he's in bozeman a lot and i think the coaches just had him in because you know he's a real popular dude and so yeah. they had him in and had him yeah they just had him come in and speak to the guys just like a team building like a team i, I team guess building. so my my yeah. son you know my son was there he listened to it yeah yeah yep. that's cool yep that's cool um now Troy, just so everybody knows, like where you you're out in the mountains, but specifically, like what what state and all that uh, do you, do you live in? Well, I'm a native Idahoan, um, mm -hmm. native Idaho, my entire life. Other than I lived in Montana when I went to college, so I've lived in Montana and Idaho. Those are my only two states of residency in my life, and I'm Idaho's really diverse. I I live up in the north part of Idaho by Canada, where I live in probably some of the best logging timber country in the in the world in the Pacific Northwest. That's inland. That's yeah. not on the coast. And I live in a real conservative state. I like that. And a lot of timber. Uh, a lot of timber is not even does, doesn't do it justice. Hundreds of miles of mountains covered in timber. Hundreds right. and hundreds of miles. And I call my my home state to me is Western Montana, Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington. To me, to me that to me that's my state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and it, you, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, but you kind of do something unique, right. With, with the whitetails out there. Um, obviously when you think of those, that's those States you're talking about, a lot of people don't really think about whitetails. Um, a lot of the, a lot of guys out there focus on like your elk and your, your mule deer. Um, right. For the most part. Uh, no, not, um, I, I think, that was conventional 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Okay. Today, today, whitetails are really popular out here. They get hunted by more hunters than any, all the other, you know, there's more people hunting whitetails than any species. A lot has changed. Obviously the, so the social media media of whitetails in general has blown whitetails up everywhere because yeah. you can hunt them in every state. Uh, yes. Elk, mule deer are still cool. And, the hardcore archery elk hunters is still a big thing out here. 
in all three of the states I'm talking about. But whitetails are have a lot more traction than I think people realize now. And okay. I, I like to shed a little light on it. I mean, it, they they get they get hunted hard. And we live in I live in quality, high quality whitetail habitat. Uh, when you talk about all the habitat that that I get a hunt and the type of country that the habitat grows in and thrives in, it's pretty it's pretty incredible place to hunt a whitetail deer. I mean, it's, it's tough, but it's, yeah. we, we can get into it. We could dive down a million rabbit holes, but no, it's, it's super cool whitetail country. And it's probably the, the most vast whitetail habitat anybody would ever tackle ever anywhere on the, on the planet. That's interesting. See, like, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know whitetail hunting was as popular as it was out there. I've never hunted out there for whitetail though. I've, and I've been out, out West hunting elk and mule deer, but not whitetails. So the, um, the western whitetail is famous in the river bottoms, which everybody's seen yeah, that. Sure, like Milk but, River and all that back in the day. Yeah, and yeah. Wy Wy Wyoming, Montana, yeah. the river, even the river bottoms of Idaho, southern Idaho, the river bottoms in eastern Washington. That's where it's more famous because it's a lot more target-rich environment. Uh, there's okay. way more. There's more deer. There's more deer, but probably easier to hunt too, right? Oh, exponentially. Way yeah. different, completely different playing field. You're going to see a lot of deer, a lot of ag. Uh, for me, though, it's my life is in the high country, the high elevation mountain whitetails. Ninety percent of my hunting, ninety percent or more, of my entire life is that's where it's been. Um, all public, hundred percent all public. Have you ever uh, chased any blacktails out, out there, out west of you? No, I haven't. I haven't got far enough west, nor have I ever had the bug, even though I'm not terribly far from black tails. I'm probably five, six hours. Just have dedicated all my time to hunting White public tail. land mountain bucks. And yeah. when you're bow and when you're bow hunting them, you gotta put a lot of time in on the in the big sure. mountain. A friend of mine lives in Oregon out there and he's invited me out to go black tail hunting and I'm really thinking about it. I, I think I think you should jump on it if you're interested because it's cool and they're they're a really cool deer. Oh, I mean, I've beautiful, got, beautiful looking deer. Yeah, I got buddies that hunt them and those guys that hunt them over there that I know, a couple guys that really into it. It's just like us guys that love whitetails; they're passionate about them. Yeah, and I think they're hunted very similar. You know, pretty similar, uh, or you can hunt them pretty similar. Um, at least my buddy does that. Yep. That uh, I know. I don't know much about them, but yep. The guys yeah. that bow hunt them hunt them pretty similar to the way we hunt mountain whitetails out here. Because I know I know a lot of their they get through a lot of their, their information from the same places you know we get our information from for for whitetails. Just not as much blacktail information out there and you, uh, specific blacktail. Not like there is whitetails at least. Yep. Um. All right, let's get talking about some tactics, Troy. Uh, I got I got I want to start off with with mock scrapes because. Um, for, for me, the first time I ever kind of heard of Troy Pottinger, I think you were talking about mock scrapes on a podcast and, uh, the last couple of years I've tried to implement mock scrapes into my tactics or arsenals. And, and I've, you know, I've had success, but I think I'm doing some things wrong. So I just, I just wanted, I had a list of questions for you to run through, um, wow. and just talk about, talk about that. And I'm sure those questions will lead into other topics and tactics too. Um, but like, I guess how, whenever you're, you're thinking about mock scrapes, like how, how much do you utilize them? And, and, um, like what, what do you actually use them for in your, uh, when you're whitetail hunting? I don't hunt a deer without them. Okay. Have not for, have not for 25 years minimum. And the five years to 10 years previous to that, I was using them, learning about teaching myself how to do it and how to use them. But now nah, since the late nineties, I can't think of a deer I haven't killed in conjunction in the mountains with a mock scrape or an existing scrape that I overmark. Okay. So, um, I mean, they're pretty, I don't hunt without them. I got you. Um, so, so I guess this, you answered my second question a little bit. I was going to ask you, like, when should you not use them? Like, you you still use like your mock mock scrapes or your scent, even when there's an existing scrape there already. You may you may freshen oh, it yeah. up or. Oh well, uh, well, your 
yeah, I, I'm introducing more deer to the best deer I can find. So I'm either going to overmark his key social hubs, which are community scrapes, with me, which is my synthetic mix. I'm going to throw stuff at him to obviously stimulate his curiosity and wonder who the hell's in his territory. Or I'm going to build a mock scrape to elicit a response from him in the daylight or try to move him to where he's more killable. So there's a lot of different reasons why I use scrapes and how I use them. And I use them year round to condition deer to grow up on them so that my all the deer in the local areas that I target a specific buck in, all those younger deer get really used to my scrapes and want to address them and check them year round. So I just get them on a, I, I get them in a situation where I condition them for years. And then when they reach an age that I like, which is always five years or older, and I go in to hunt them, I put a lot of work into that deer for like, like example, that deer I killed this year, I, I worked on him for four years before I ever hunted him. And I killed him the third time I hunted him, specifically hunted him. But I worked on him for four years. And he he fortunately survived. And guys will ask me, Troy, how many of your two and a half year olds make it to five and a half? And if you do the math, it's two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half. That's four years. Mm-hmm. I'd say 10%, 15% max because of the playing field that I live in with predators and hunting pressure. Yeah. So to answer your question, there's probably way more to it than we could talk about in 45 minutes. Now, I mean, we can't, we can scratch the surface. We can scratch the surface, but there's so much more to it than people realize or know about me. Um, It is all science. It's all biology and, You know, 20 years ago, people laughed at me for hunting licking branches on August 30th on opening day, and now nobody does. 10 years ago, it started grabbing traction, and people started looking at the biology of whitetails. And, you know, you never never saw any of the people that were hunting highly managed properties or, you know, hunts that were deer don't get a lot of pressure. You never saw 20, even 15, 20, even 10 years ago people talking about hunting scrapes or paying attention to scrapes or even understanding scrapes year round. Now, now the, the biological information and proof on video and trail cameras is out there. I was and, just going to ask, yeah. did, did, did the trail camera um, wave that came, came about whenever all that stuff started coming into the market, did that really help prove yeah. some things to people? Yeah. What I'm going to use myself as an example. In the early 2000s, when I started running trail cameras, and I would say move all the way up to 2010, when the video capabilities of trail cameras got better, where we could really video deer for 30 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, whatever the cameras were. And you go back to 2010, I've got a lot of old cameras. And if you go back and look at them, 15 second video was pretty good back in the day. Yeah. Or or 10 second video. So what happened was is, you know, film never lies. Footage doesn't lie. So as soon as, as soon as like for me personally, as soon as I just started putting them, sending guys videos or putting them on like a YouTube page and say, well, here you go. You know, I teach whitetail hunting boot camps out here, uh, three states. When, when you show the video proof of year round, white year round bucks, including the oldest and best bucks in the, in the public land mountains and down on the private, wherever I would hang a camera just to get video of bucks using year round and does and fawns, they all use them. That's when everybody was like, all of a sudden I was getting a lot of messages and a lot of guys saying, Hey, what are you doing here? What's really going on? And way before trail cameras, that's how I was hunting them too. I could just, I, I read the woods and could read foot. I could read the tracks and the big prints versus the small, even on my licking branches in the spring when I was picking their sheds up, they were still standing in the scrapes and using the licking branches, even though they weren't pawing at it. So 
for me way back, that just made all the sense in the world for me to target big deer because the de the white tails, especially the older bucks are really conditioned and it's ingrained in their DNA to keep track of the entire herd in an area that they're taking care of, that they're want to procreate in. Maybe, maybe talk about that buck you killed this year and kind of the, the, the scrape set up and kind of lay that out, that out for us. And we'll just work off that then. Okay. He's sitting right here. There he is. I don't know if you can see. Him. Oh yeah. He's a big one. <laughs> so, and the reason I'm showing him is the skull plate. You can see this, this buck was either five and a half or six and a half based on four years of watching him. Um, yeah. And, and a buck that I got to watch grow up in condition. So he was one of several, uh, the system that I run and have created to, to find success in is conditioning herds and drainages of deer. And my drainages are huge. Some of my drainages are 20 miles long, some are five miles long, some are 10 miles long. The elevation can go from 2000 feet up to seven. So we're talking the, t the size of country that I don't think many can like relate to unless they came out and elk hunted it and saw it. Yeah. Yeah. But what, I, what, what, what the, the reason I went with, sorry, my shed dogs are chewing on antlers here. Boys, relax. If you guys hear a noise, sorry. Hopefully that's not too loud. I got two shed dogs chewing on antlers. They want to go shed hunting. I got one in the next room. She's uh, <laughs> four months old and she was pretty good. Like, she was pretty calm when she was a couple months old, but now she's getting to where she just like wired for sound. So right, I used to she used to just lay here next to me during these shows, but now <laughs> she uh, she has to go in the kennel because she's just too much. These two uh, guys are just chewing on sheds and sick of me talking. They wish we were hunting. <laughs> but anyway, back to back to answer your question. The whole scrape biology and the and it's not even a game. It's like what white tails do. I hunt a state, I grew up in a state where you can't feed, you can't bait. And since then, you know, I hunt states where you can. So I have to play that game too, to, to do well. And we could talk about any of it. But I grew up in Idaho where there was no feeding, no baiting allowed. And bow hunting, an old mature whitetail buck in vast country with apex predators on every mountain and in every drainage, I had to come up with something that made a lot of sense to get a mature buck to frequent. And the scrape was obviously that perfect social meeting place and hub if it's in the right location for daylight, you know, for daylight visits. Mm -hmm. Now, make it sound easy now, I, you know, I had to teach myself all of this along the way and had to learn it from the deer. And I just really started diving into scrapes heavy right when I got out of college. And I learned a lot about them even before high, even, even in high school and before college, just by shed hunting and looking at these big scrapes in the spring and still seeing those big tracks in them and then finding a big old whitetail mature buck shed close to it. So it all started the pieces of the puzzle and my mind started spinning big time, even back in high school. And I, you know, I've said this before on podcasts, but I lost my dad when I was 17. So I had to teach myself. He was a really good elk and mule deer hunter. but white tails I had to teach myself and then fast forward you know college I, I got to hunt some but I was playing football so I was super busy and I did hunt as much as I could and I managed to kill a deer every year but I didn't have the time I wanted as soon as I got out of college um, got into education started my own business in the summers made it created it so that everything revolved around me being able to study white tails for free time even if it meant two or three hours in the afternoons or all days, every day I could go. And before I, and I, you know, I didn't get married till I was 30. And I did, or yeah, I was 30 when I got married. So I basically dedicated all of my 20s, 22 and on, 23 and on after college to simply living in the mountains with whitetails. Like I didn't, I didn't play softball. I, I didn't go water skiing with my buddies very often. I just hiked and shed hunted and covered. You know, I think I was averaging 250 days a year in the woods, at least partial days and 300, a couple years and, you know, a couple hundred sheds a year. And we're talking public land in the mountains. Yeah. Those were the old days before marriage. And I really was able to build a good foundation and get a grasp on scrapes. 
And what I learned from all of that was there were crucial key community heard, community visited scrapes that stood out and were way different than the majority of the scrapes that you might find in the woods. So I just keyed in on those hubs and I keyed in on those community hub scrapes that were in locations that the security cover, close bedding, tons of native feed and water sources were all there. Doe family groups used them. Mature older bucks were monitoring them and using them. And you know, I started keying in on those daylight, heavy cover, lower human pressured areas, even though the predators will still hunt those scrapes because they'll hunt those scrapes too to find the deer. Um, I, I, started, I started knocking down a lot of great bucks with a bow and arrow after I got out of college. And nobody knew what I was doing. Nobody had a clue. And if I tried to explain it to people, they looked at me like I was speaking Chinese. And this was back in the mid nineties, early night or late mid to late nineties. And it just grew from there. It was, it became, it was freaking talk about a natural high, you know, killing big deer at 10, eight, 10, 12 yards with a bow and arrow and nobody else was doing it now guys were doing it out west in the river bottoms and yeah. probably not hunting probably not hunting scrapes like i was josh but up in the mountains in the high country there's very few of us guys my age that i mean i can think of one or two out here that are around my age that were doing it most of those guys were doing it over in washington where they could feed in idaho in idaho with no bait strictly scrapes back in the old days i mean i i had people laugh at me I mean, literally, guys laugh and think, what the hell are you thinking? Eh, until I started killing really awesome deer. And then everybody was like, what's he doing? What's he yeah. really doing? Yeah. Well, I just feel like I can relate so much to some of the things you've talked about because I live in southern Indiana and I can, you know, I live in the middle of the Huger National Forest, which I can say that on here because that's a gigantic place, you know. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and uh, we, you know, we have, it's not mountainous, it's big hill country um, with big drainage big in my in the midwest terms you know uh, yeah. big drainages that go down to ag or whatever else yeah so um and we can't bait or anything obviously um and it's you know the the mock scrape thing is super inter interesting to me i'm just i'm still figuring out my path in it and how to, how to use it i guess um so what that that buck you killed this year what was your setup? What was the mock scrape? How close was it to where you think he was bedding? What was around it that made you think like this is a, because there's scrapes everywhere in the woods, right? Like you walk down the, the man trail going to your stand, there's probably a scrape there in November. Um, like, I guess what, what was special about this spot um, and, and what made you set up on it? Well, it's a spot that I've killed other big deer on. Um, he reloaded into there after we, we you know, couple big deer were killed off that mountain he i always had him at a different area when he was growing up not not a long ways away and these are mountain bucks so they cover a lot of ground so the majority of the bucks that i kill i'll i will have them in multiple spots get uh, let's uh, what's a good number over a couple miles and when you get in the mountains and you start talking two miles, three miles, sometimes four miles, when you get into topography that's steep, up and down, up and down, big, big draws. I mean, we're talking big elevation changes. If you flatten out that four miles, it's probably five or six. Yeah. But any, but anyway, he, he was, he was um, using a couple of my mock scrapes from two and a half all the way up till this year. So four, for four years, I, I know he was at least two and a half when I first found him. So I know he was at least that old based on his body, the sheds that I found or the shed that I found, all of that, I could tell he was two and a half at least. And I keep these scrapes running year after year after year, year round because all the deer within two, three, four miles away know where these hubs are. and the bucks that live oh wait the bucks that live close to them 
will frequent them more in the daylight. And the bucks that live further away, I might catch during the rut in on specific does when they come into heat. But this deer, he, um, based on the pressure that he was receiving, uh, based on a couple bucks, in my opinion, that got taken out, including one that I killed that was a real bully buck two years before that. Um, he kind of moved in on me because I, my, a couple of my spots are positioned in very safe security, cover heavy, elevation, wind advantages to the buck. And that's why I hunt those spots because a buck really feels safe in the daylight in a couple of those spots. Well, this big deer moved in on me and started, he really started monitoring every deer that was hitting my scrapes. Uh, and it was in Washington state. So guys are baiting. Um, when I hunt Washington state, I always have to put some alfalfa out or something within 30, 40 yards of my scrape just to keep my does around. So this buck was even, he, he would walk right through my scrapes in the broad daylight. And then he might come in and get a bite to eat every now and then at night. So I play that game in those states where people bait too, that even though my big buck might not stand in a feet, you know, in the hay or, you know, we hunt a lot like Canada over in Washington, like the Canadians do up in Saskatchewan. But our bucks are so shy of being at a feed site that if you, I make this triangle and I put a big scrape far enough away that I can almost always get my best bucks to check the scrape, maybe put eyes across the timber and make sure, every, see if there's some does over. And if they don't see what they like or scent check or what they like, they'll bug out and they'll leave during the day. Well, this buck was actually, he was kind of being a little bit too cocky in my opinion. I thought he was in big trouble because he started daylighting at both of my spots, at that triangle, at that specific scrape that I built this scrape about a dozen years ago. No, nah, probably 10. I'll take that back. Probably 10 years ago. And he had known it for at least four years. And he had known my other scrape that I used to get him on most of the time more because he was at it more often but it's again as soon as we took out a couple of these big bucks on this mountain he moved over closer to me and he just started daylight feeling really safe where i'm at so i really target community scrapes that are either a mock scrape which i turn them into a, a community scrape i target those locations where a lot of deer want to be in the daylight and feel safe and usually it usually it's in conjunction with really good bedding that's not very far away he started, you know, I call it, he started getting done. I mean, he started getting like really brave and I figured I would kill him uh, if somebody else didn't get to him before me. Cause he was kind of being brave in multiple places on the mountain. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I caught him. I caught him. I believe it was my third targeted hunt for him. I think I did a partial day, a full day, and then a two hour sit in the morning, came in on him backside of the mountain, early morning daylight caught him coming in by himself thinking everything was safe. I shot him at eight that morning. Uh, but again, Josh, I, I also didn't shoot that deer for four years. Yeah. I did not shoot him. I did not ever spook him at any of those spots for four years. Did other bucks die and get killed before they reached that magical age for me? Absolutely. But I just, I really love hunting the, the old mature ones and, I like seeing them get to their full potential. So that's what I target. How close to betting you think you were from him? Oh, uh, when he was, when he was on me in the daylight, I can guarantee you that deer was not bedded more than 200 yards from me. Like okay. that morning when I killed him, I, you know, if I had one of those thermal, what drones or whatever they have? Yeah, <laughs> those darn thermal thermal those drones. Things are going to run hunting. <laughs> I, I I don't. Yeah, let's not go down that rabbit hole because I don't even want to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, my whole point is, I think you would have found that deer that morning within two hundred yards of me if we had one of those. I really believe that. Um, a lot of times, that uh, most of the time, I know those bucks are super close to me when I kill them because most of the time. Oh, sorry, my lab's in my lap. Um, You're good. 
most of the time, hi buddy. Most of the time, my big bucks come in when I kill them, Josh, and I have snow, and they'll have snow in their rack. So what's that tell you? They're real yeah, close. They, they, haven't, they haven't went very far. Yeah, so I would say, I, I would guess if I had to give you a number, I think my son would agree with me. He's been doing this with me for a long time. I bet you 200 yards max, maybe closer, maybe maybe 100, because the amount of detail and effort I went to to get in there that morning was borderline ridiculous i left at 2 18 in the morning uh and i went through multiple detailed strategic steps to make sure he didn't know i was up there how important is access for you guys out there in the mountains it's it's huge josh because we have mountain lions and wolves and black bears and grizzlies and and, and the reason people you know people can stop and think about that my whitetails get hunted in their beds all night long sometimes. Yeah. My whitetails get hunted by animals that have soft feet that make no noise. It'd be like you and I walking in our bare feet up on them. And they're unbelievable hunters. So my animals, if they sense, hear, smell, feel something isn't right, they just bug out. And it's because a lot of it's because of the lions and the wolves. They bug. And then when they bug out, they might run. They might not even stop jogging and running for two, for two or three miles until they, until they feel safe. And the reason being is when a pack of wolves or a lion gets on a deer, they will chase them for miles. So my deer are the deer that I hunt, especially the old bucks that have made it and figured out how to survive. Um, the deer that I hunt are real sensitive ultra sensitive to any type of intrusion so a huge imp or a huge factor for me being successful in this country one really you got to find one two you got to pray that he makes it the years that you want him to get to age not ruin my setups and then be able to get on on the day to kill him when he's killable without screwing it up and of course because it's so, such heavy cover out here josh and timber for miles glassing where, where i purposely hunt and find big deer i purposely look for places that don't have logging clear cuts and don't have big glassing areas for rifle hunters so glassing for me is 50 to 100 yards max ever mm -hmm. so my bucks are really nose heavy like they really rely on their nose they rely on their eyes and ears their eyes and their ears but that nose is number one to them and they they have extremely strong thermals to play into their favor for daily bedding at high elevations. So they'll yeah. they'll usually bed high. They'll usually bed high. And I saw that, you know, you talked about those rolling hills that you hunt. I saw the exact same, 100% exact same behavior on all the Ohio whitetails that I just came back from hunting in late December, early January, when I got to hunt some hilly country, the, the whitetails out there were using those thermals, the, the bucks were, were using them exactly the same way on a smaller scale as my bucks do out here. Yeah. So security cover was near the scrape. He's bedding fairly close and you had some food there for him. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, you know, the biggest thing too is up there were, and I say up, uh, my elevation was positioned to where I believe he felt the safest of anywhere for a couple miles. Just and because of the cover, the security cover and just just the pure difficulty of, you know, good luck walking straight up a mountain and trying to kill that white tailed deer without him knowing you're coming on an uphill thermal. You get an uphill thermal from after the first hour of daylight till almost dark every day. And yeah. those bucks, those bucks lay down and use those. So I actually killed this buck by coming in on the back side of the mountain of where I thought he was bedding. So basically the slope that I knew I, I believed he was bedding on to get to me, I came in the long way on the back side of the mountain and basically met him at a spot to where I never crossed him. Never crossed him with my wind, ever. Yep. Now that's hunting washington state i've killed way more deer in idaho than i have washington because it's my home state 
And that hunt right there works every bit as good. And is, I've, I've done it multiple, you know, dozens of times in Idaho with a big community scrape because I don't have to compete against everybody baiting, which I like. I enjoy yeah. that. I don't have to compete against it other than people that are cheating in Idaho. And some guys do, but big old Idaho mountain bucks, they're, they're pretty careful. They're, you know, all the elk hunters in this country for decades have done salt licks and it's illegal and you can't hunt over them. But these deer in Idaho, no salt licks are around, but I guarantee you the old whitetails aren't hitting a salt lick in the daylight very often. If they did, they would have been dead when, you know, they would have been right. dead before they made five years old. So anyway, yeah. uh, it's just, I play the game, uh, what, whatever I need to play in every state that I hunt to be, to have the best opportunity to kill an old deer. Yep. A lot of people I've been hunting. This was only my second year hunting Ohio. Yeah. I was successful my first year, the second year, this year, I didn't get to hunt a whole lot. I had a little, I had a baby in October, but, um, I got out there a few times, but I, I, uh, I hear a lot of the same when I'm in Ohio, like a lot of competition there because of the baiting mm -hmm. people claim you can't bait. And it's, you know, well, you know, you hunted over there. Um, well, I, I don't know exactly where you hunted at in Ohio, but, um, where I hunt in the Southern, Southern half, it's, it's, you know, it's hilly. It's extremely hilly for the East cut for the east for out East here. It's, uh, you know, borderline, you know, mountainous. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Can, can we like, like as best as you can describe a mock scrape, like how, like when you get up to one, how, how do you actually make it? Cause I feel like this is something that I probably don't do a good enough job is my detailed, how detailed I am with my actually making a mock scrape. Yeah. So for me, I'm, if I'm going to build a mock, it's going to, it's going to mimic a community scrape. Okay. That's because every deer for a hundred miles of me or 200 miles of me in every direction, the community scrapes are the scrapes that the entire local deer herd know where it's at. They've been raised on it and they'll go to it. And there's two types of community scrapes. There's community scrapes that pretty much all the deer within a couple miles, two, three, four, five miles, even in the mountain country will know because they do travel a lot that they feel safe hitting at night. And that'll be based on human pressure, maybe even predator advantage, wind, wind disadvantage to them, but they'll still check them at night because there's a lot of deer that check them at night. Those type of community scrapes do not interest me. There's also hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testosterone, rut frenzy based, scratched out scrapes that not nothing ever materializes at those from young bucks. And then there's the gold mine type scrapes that are located in, they're positioned and located. And this has been true to everywhere I've ever hunted in the country, every state. And, and, and I look for these no matter where I hunt and they they exist. These scrapes that I mimic, that I make a mock out of, they look just like what I find in a true daylight visited uh, area that's for what you need, and you have to figure out the reasons why once you find one. Yeah. That the pressure for whatever reason at that exact location, and it's based on multiple factors of the biology of a deer, where they like to eat, where they like to bed, where they get away from all pressures. These are usually in pretty heavy security cover or right off the edges of huge giant blocks of security. And I will mimic those types of scrapes. And I also really work hard to find those types of locations. Because as soon as you can lay down a big mock scrape that looks like your local deer herds community scrapes, and if you put it in a location, that the entire local deer herd, including the old bucks, feel safe getting to and exiting, then you're in the game and you're in the game big time. So for every listener out there, this isn't just for Idaho, Montana, Washington, and Canada, where I spend most of my time. Uh, this is everywhere I've ever been. 
And I've seen it in Oklahoma, Ohio, North Dakota, doesn't matter where I go. If you can place or, or find, find some of these, go find them, stop and really take some time to examine them. Look at the tree species that the deer prefer, study the ground and how, you know, how big the, these community scrapes are in your, to your local deer. Then I take that, that entire picture of what I find. And, I, and obviously I've been doing this for decades. I go replicate that somewhere else in a spot where there needs to be one, in my opinion. And I, and then I add multiple deer profiles to it, all synthetics, multiple deer, because as soon as the white tails in that mock spot, walk in and inspect it or get a smell of it and go to it because they go right to them when they sent when they smell them i get in build them get out attention to detail is so crucial we can go into that next mm -hmm. but it's but it's basically what they've seen their entire life and that they know especially the old does and the old bucks and what happens with my oldest bucks and i've got years of video proof of this you know, I'll put a mock community scrape real close to where I find his sheds or find him first. And basically what I'm doing, Josh, is I'm putting it right in his lap. And he has no choice but either to address it or if I screw it up and really foul it up, which I don't, I'm very careful. I mean, I might have in the past, but I don't anymore. I'm very careful. He either addresses it or, you know, he just, he. the truth is he can't not address it. And it's cool watching them come in. My favorite videos in my entire life are still to this day when when the big mature bucks that are five years and older inspect my community scrape that I built. So I built a mock community for him. And I'll get two or three bucks sometimes because of the location I'm at. It's a great area for old bucks to, to die of old age. Those bucks walk in and they spend more time than any deer in the entire herd inspecting it. They spend more time initially inspecting it. They, a lot of times they'll hang around it for 10 to 15, 20 minutes. And what's going on, if you really watch his behavior and his body language, is he's processing all of this information and what I see in their body language and what I get in return frequency is, he wants to know how in the hell he missed this his whole life in his territory. And I see it all the time, Josh, and it works. Uh, works every state I've ever hunted in. Uh, worked for me in Ohio. I just ran out of time. It, I, I let a five-year-old buck. I didn't even hunt him because he wasn't what I was looking for, but he was five years old. Uh, and, and I got to see that happen in eight days. So I'm mimicking the greatest gold mine type scrapes, which are community, long-standing, traditional scrapes. I'm mimicking everything about them and moving them to a deer or a specific area that I think holds a big deer, if you will. Okay. So like a mock scrape here may look a little different than what it looks like out in Idaho. You know, I, a guy just needs to go out and, and figure out what he needs to mimic. You mean, you mean a real scrape, a real scrape. Yes, might look, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you're talking an existing true scrape. You know, I've been letting the deer teach me more than anybody, than any, you know, what you, what you do in 10 days of scouting, 12, 15 hours a day pays bigger dividends than reading books for five years. And I mean that. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so I'm going out there, Josh, and I'm really, and this is, you know, you're probably what, thirties at the oldest. Yeah. I'm 33. Yeah. When I was your age, Josh, that's when I was really knocking down the I mean, when I was 33, I killed the number two a buck in the state Idaho. So I was getting my game. It was, I was get, getting it figured out with a boat. And what it got me to that point, Josh, is just the amount of time I spent allowing the deer to teach me everything I could learn by scouting and really paying attention to the scrapes they used year round versus the ones that dried up and weren't worth a shit. Mm -hmm. So that I really started to have to differentiate those because if you just hunt scrapes and you just throw a scrape out, most of the time you're wasting your time. You've really got to dial into those hubs, those community social hubs. 
that all the deer feel safe at. And, and those nighttime ones are, are great for pictures, but if you're not getting great daylight at those nighttime community scrapes, you got to move. So you take the mock, the mocking of a scrape, and you implement that where the location is better for daylight movement of all your deer, including your oldest bucks. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. And and you kind of hit you hit a nerve with me there because you said uh, you're wasting your time. And, and I you know I I tried a bunch of different ways of um, producing the mock scrapes, and you know some of them were productive, and some of them I just was like, what the heck, you know. It was probably just me being stupid, you know, making mistakes. But Josh, if I go, ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was no, just going to say, if I if I came out with you for ten days and you said you're in Indiana, yep, Southern Indiana, yep. If I could have ten days in Indiana to hike those, hike that big Forest Service country. It sounds like Forest Service National Forest Service ground. Yeah, it's National Forest. Yep. I would, I would literally. My approach would be: I would go hike it. And I would grid great looking areas that had good sign, but I would be looking for one key factor. I would find the community scrapes that the deer have already been using in your areas for decades. And the, the, the proof for decades is at the scrape. You have to know what you're looking for to see that. You need to see that years and years and years of use at those licking branches on the ground you really gotta you really gotta zone in on what you're looking for i would i would obviously be able to look at topos and look at all your maps and pick some areas i think they'd be good in but as soon as i found some that showed decades of use i would really pay close attention to the species of licking branch that those deer are using that lasts for years and years and then I would really inspect that soil and how they're pawned up and using it. And then I would immediately inspect everything within a mile of every direction and break down all the trails, all the bedding, the best food sources, everything to that scrape. And then of course, if I live there like you do, I'd throw a camera on that scrape and I'd just let the deer tell me everything they need to know that I need to know. And then if that Let's say we found one. If it showed me daylight movement right now, bucks that are just starting to grow their antlers right now, I would leave a camera on that year round and I would learn from those deer. And then even during the pressured hunting seasons, I would learn how they reacted at that spot because that's what I do out here. And I would see if it was a true daylight quality frequency place or not. And if it's a true daylight quality frequency scrape that's a community hub, then I would probably hunt it. But if not, then I would take that same exact look, picture, species, and go build it in a better location. If there was a deer I wanted to hunt in that one mile circle around it, and I would throw that same look, multiple deer profiles, I would build the licking branches exactly like what the deer had showed me there i'd build the scrape probably relatively the same size and see what happened and and i do that out here year after year after year everywhere i go so do you ever have you ever messed with like the the rope scrapes or like the hemp rope scrapes no no you never you're never going to see me do anything but all natural does does that mean i'm saying that stuff doesn't work no I will. I'm not going to change from what works. So just has been incredible for me. I'm staying all natural. The only thing that I use is synthetics because I'm a huge believer. I mean, I got my background's kinesiology and biology. I don't like using anything that can rot or stink mm -hmm. over time. And I really like synthetics. I use the buck fever synthetics because it has never failed me. The only mm -hmm. thing that I've ever failed at is a scrape. And I'll say this, when I was younger, I was probably a little sloppy sometimes and got my human odor on like the licking branch. I didn't blow out the young bucks and the less tolerant deer, but I, the old bucks caught on to me right away. And then, and then all of a sudden they're only showing up at night. Now that was several decades ago when I first started running trail cameras. That really helped me uh, critique myself and, and my process. So no, Josh, I don't use any of the, I'm going to, to me, it's, 
to me, you know, those those companies are selling that stuff too to make some money. So, you know, do whatever you want, use whatever you want if it works in your state. But I like all natural because I don't have to pack anything in. I don't have to give away an obvious spot at a, uh, you know, public land. You know, if I hang a rope somewhere on public land, then everybody's looking for my tree stand or tree at least. Then everybody's looking for my trail camera. Then all my shit's gone. Then it's stolen. Yeah. <laughs> you, you want to, yeah. I mean, I, hey, Josh, tw- you're talking 40 years of public land hunting. 40. I get it. No, I 40. get it. So I get it. Uh, most guys, well, here, here's a quick, I, you, I think your viewers will appreciate this. The stuff I build is so authentic that I walked in to hunt a big buck one day and I had a dude in a climber sitting over my scrapes, three cameras and a tree stand. And I had it all hidden so well that he didn't notice any of it. And when I walked in, he about shit when I come walking in, cause I looked up at him and I said, how's it going? And he goes, he looked at me like, what are you doing here? And he started to say something. And I said, pretty good looking scrapes, huh? And he goes, yeah. Like, who are you? And I said, I built those. And then yeah. I said, you see, then I said, do you see that camera? Do you see that camera? Do you see that tree stand? And he was a really nice guy. He looked around and went, he goes, I am so sorry. He goes, I thought this was the most incredible white tail buck spot I've ever seen in my life. Now, if he would have, if he, I think he was an honest guy and hadn't looked at my cards. I think he just jumped up there in his climber. I think if he'd have looked at my cards, he would have shit. Like he would have yeah. been like, he would have been like, yeah, I see why this guy's here. And my point is, Josh, I try to make everything look so natural that if an elk hunter or somebody walks through, oh, that's just another scrape. Walk on through. Don't even think about it. Don't mess with anything. Yeah. Yeah. And my stuff, I, on public land, I've had, you know, I had too much stuff stolen to where I really play it authentic as I can. So no on the ropes, no on any of that. No, you don't like tie branches down or anything like that for the, the, the one thing I do that would be a giveaway with me sometimes, and I haven't had any issues with it, but I probably will someday is every now and then when I transfer my preferred licking branch species, mm-hmm. uh, I do use paracord and, and yeah. sometimes, and sometimes a strap, but I, I always try to use dark green paracord and I always use dark green straps. They're really hard to notice unless you're really looking for it. Right. Uh, I've been I've been fortunate with paracord, and that's about the only thing I hang out there that isn't natural. And it's usually just the paracord. Usually, I can get away with paracord to to transplant the perfect the licking branch that the deer like over the right scrape and the right location, so that my access and exit is the best I can get it to kill. So it's all it's all it all ties into the end goal of killing these old deer. What about scent control? Troy, you mentioned that just a second ago about touching licking branches and stuff. What's your scent control like regimen for doing this kind of thing? You can ask my son this one. (laughs) (laughs) If it's a big deer that dad's interested in hundred percent latex gloves, if it's, or I use those nice rubber palmed gardening gloves. Yeah. You know, you can buy them anywhere. We, yeah. we always use at least the rubber palm gloves, just like a trapper yeah. or, or latex. I kind of like the rubber palmed ones the best when I'm making a new build. Why? Because durable. I got it. Yeah, yeah durable. more durable. Yeah. Latex, I tend to use when I'm just touching stuff up. Mm-hmm. It, it's already built. But yeah, it's that scent control is huge. Keep your damn right. hands off your licking branch. Now, there's people that say it doesn't matter where I live. You're not hunting my deer. You're not hunting. You're not hunting a deer that gets hunted 365 days a year. You're hunting a deer that his biggest threat is hunting season. My mm. deer's big. My deer, their biggest threat is a mountain lion daily. So yeah. when they smell anything they don't like that spooks them, they freak out and they leave. And when I say they freak out, they just they just move. They just move quite a ways away. Uh, sometimes I, some well in the past, not anymore, but a long time ago, I mean, I blew it on a couple great builds to where I was in a hurry. I know I use my bare hands. I know I got too much scent on the licking branch and the buck that I picked up sheds to, or maybe head on him on a trail camera once or twice, never shows up again. 
at that scrape, except for late at night, dark, maybe a couple times. So just like a trapper, really clean hands. Uh, you know, don't get your sweaty body on anything if you're doing it in the spring or early summer. I really watch where I step. I don't pack any type of tool into the woods because my stuff's too remote. It's a waste. I don't want to pack rakes and shit into the woods. So yeah. I will, uh, all, I always just grab a great big tree limb. This, my country is all trees. There's limbs everywhere. I'll break a big dug fir branch off or I'll grab a tamarack branch off the ground and I dig everything out with that branch. Gloves on for the licking branches, build them build them all perfectly you know it's good at make them really look authentic twist them turn them get them hanging vertically like they've been there for decades multiple licking branches you know most of my scrapes in this country are at least three or four feet in diameter but they're shaped like a teardrop they're narrower on the top you know buck's big chest he scrapes here and here he yeah. scrapes and kicks everything it fan all all big bucks fan everything out because of their chest mm -hmm. little does little does kick straight back but the big guys the big guys kick everything to the side and back. So it's always shaped like a teardrop. And I used to wear the rubber boots where it was applicable, but most of my country is too far of a hike. I mean, rubber boots just don't work in the mountain country. So yeah. I wear all of my boots that I wear have that like rubber, uh, rubber wrap, that rubberized wrap around like my Krispies or my Hoffman's. Yep. And I always spray them down. And then all my clothes, if it's a if it's a deer that I'm serious about and want to go kill or get on, all of my clothes never come in my house ever. Once a year, maybe to wash them in baking soda, maybe twice a year max. They always hang outside under a porch that's covered and open, so they always air out. So my clothes go from my porch to on me. I get dressed on my porch all the time, scouting right now, or hunting. I treat everything with big deer and or old deer and scrapes, Josh, I treat it like I'm hunting that deer that day. That's how particular I am on a deer that I want to kill. And once you learn to do that all the time, it's easy. It's not even a lot of work. Yeah. So throw the clothes on, go, hunt, go do the work. A lot of times too, I'll throw the clothes in a, in a tote that's out on my porch. that's wide open, aired out, throw the clothes in there. If I'm, like when it gets real serious, get to my spot, get out of my truck, strip down, spray down with the vanishing hunter, put my clothes on out of my tote. So they haven't even been in my pickup. That's when, that's when I'm real serious. Like big deer stud, uh, go to all of those extremes. And that's just for a day of checking a trail camera and freshening in a scrape right now. If if it's on the type of deer that I don't want to blow out of the country, if he's, if he's already moved back in there right now. Okay. I think, I think we covered all my questions I had. Um, oh no, this wasn't my question. My buddy Zank though, he was on earlier. What do you think about peeing in scrapes? I've tried it. I've tested it. I've yeah. never, I've never seen a negative reaction in, I've never seen a negative reaction from it, but I can tell you this, when you add multiple does to a scrape that should be like, when, you, when you're when you adding multiple deer, not just does, when you add multiple deer to a scrape, a seasoned old veteran buck puts his nose down there and goes, there's way more than one deer here. This is real. This is what a real community scrape has in it when I find them naturally. And, and he knows that. So if you pee in it, I think you're adding one item of urine to the scrape that he's going to scent check. I personally haven't seen it spook anything because I've tested every product out there. I've tested my own urine. Uh, yeah, I'm always curious, always testing stuff. Oh, it doesn't elicit the responses I get with building a true multiple deer profile. When I say profiles, I'm talking about glands and everything, not just urine. I mean, I'm putting everything you could think of and more on a licking branch and in a scrape. It's all synthetic. None of it rots. So do I think it's usable? Do I think you can do it? Sure. Yeah. Is that my method of, of success in killing the, the caliber of bucks I've killed over the last 30 years? No. Uh, 
if I'm in a pinch and need to pee in a scrape because, oh crap, I forgot all my stuff back at the house. I would have, I honestly would have no problem peeing in a scrape. I would not. Yeah. Yep. Any, uh, any typ- typically, typically what type of time of year are you making these scrapes or do you think it really matters? I make, I'm building them right. I'm, I'm refreshing them running cameras year round. Okay. Licking branches get addressed year round by deer. So the game outside of the middle of August for me until my season closes at Christmas, the outside of those dates, I'm I'm touching up a licking branch if I happen to walk by at shed hunting or need to check a camera. Anytime, and I think this is what you're asking. Let's say I go build a mock. For example, I got a big deer I want to kill next year right now. Like I actually do. I want to kill him next year. And this weekend, I'm going to go put in a couple scrapes for him that I think he'll address. And it's a deer that I've left alone because I've been hunting other deer, but he's next up on the hit list potentially if he makes the winter. So I want to go find his sheds right now. I want to find him this weekend. And I'm going to position a couple scrapes on him that I will build the type of mock community scrapes that he's already shown me that he hits of mine a long ways away, but I'm too far from him, in my opinion, to see him very often. So now I'm going to take my game right at him and I'm going to start him. I'll start him this weekend, whether I find his sheds or not, and I'll throw a camera on him and I will be meticulous like a trapper and build these and let my camera run right now and there's a good chance, Josh, this happens a lot with my system and the methods that I use to hunt whitetails. I'll probably pick him up and I'll probably get to watch him grow his rack this year. I'll probably pick him up based on where I believe he is. And that's based off of historical data I have on him being a little too far from him. Okay. Year around, year around Josh. Why? Because deer address licking branches year round. They do. Okay. So so let me add this, Josh. I know you're ready to shut me off, but let me add this no, for you. No, listeners. no, keep going. You're good as well, long as long as you're good, I'm good. No, I'm great. And I don't want to leave the listeners. I don't want to leave them with like a half. Like here they need to hear this too. Because it may it'll make sense. Anytime a white tailed deer walks up to a true community hub scrape. When they put their nose down, and I have this on video for decades, doesn't matter if it's a buck or a doe, and it's February right now, even in March, April, May, and June, all those months, I see this all the time. They'll walk through it, they'll drop their nose, and if you watch close, they're dropping their head just to, it just, they naturally just do it and they pick up residual scent that's in that dirt. Urine crystallizes and it's that scent. My shed dogs can smell it. A coyote can smell it. A mountain lion can smell it. And a deer and a bear can smell it. And a wolf can smell it. So they'll drop their head even outside of, even outside of packing antlers and in the prime time of hunting, they'll drop their head. They'll smell a little, and then they'll go address the licking branch this time of the year. They'll deposit their identity. And, and when they deposit their identity, Every deer that deposits its identity, based on how well they're metabolizing protein, they leave that in their scent to let the rest of the herd know, hey, I'm still here, I'm healthy, I'm alive. Or it might leave a note that says, I'm not very healthy right now and I may not make it based on how they, how they metabolize protein. So that's all left in the scents and in the urine. They leave it in their glands, they leave it on the ground. So these deer are not only just communicating, they're realizing that, okay, John and Ed and Mary and Alice are all still alive in the herd. They're still around. And those old bucks, they check those licking branches this time of the year, and they really lay their scent on, especially in the mountains, because they want all the people, all excuse me, all the deer in the woods to know, hey, I made it. I'm still here. This is still my kingdom. This is still my territory. And I see that in my videos decade after decade 
of my best oldest bucks working the licking branches more than all the other deer this time of year. During this time of year, they really lay it out there. Plus my deer migrate. Some, not all of them. Some of my deer migrate, Josh. So when they get back to their spring, summer and fall homes, after the snow melts, a lot of them haven't even got back yet. They really lay their scent down in April and May because they're wanting all the animal, the, the deer in the herd, in the drainages to know I'm still around. I'm still here. Are you here? Are you around? Deer are very social. We all know that. Yeah. They really like to hang out minus the old hermit bucks. Right. So yeah, Josh, it's, it's a year round game for me. I love it. And those year round soaker cameras, they're unbelievable. If you run them on video, throw your natural windicator in the video somewhere behind you. I use old man's beard. And then that tells you everything about an old buck, how he approaches your spot, your scrape. Talk about that a little bit because someone asked a question about that in the comments. And if you guys have questions for Troy, just leave them in the comments and we'll get to them tonight. The old man beard. What's that about? Okay, so all the coniferous timber out here in these forests, all these states I'm talking about, yep. this old man beard, this old man's beard grows on the trees. And it's between three, five, six, ten, twelve inches long, a stringy, mm -hmm. uh, hair like. Fiber. Yeah, it's everywhere. I always grab two or three chunks of that. Now, deer like to eat it, so you got to be careful where you place it. In any place I'm serious about killing an old buck on, I have two or three of those strips of that hanging off in the background on any camera that's running on video. That way, every time I see that buck or some young bucks coming in, does. I can break down every deer that addresses that scrape all through April, May, June, July, August into the hunting season, how they prefer to enter that scrape based on the exact wind currents and thermal mix. Makes sense. And that can be deadly on an old buck that's very particular on certain winds and certain thermals. That's a good tip. I don't think I've never heard of anybody doing that, putting a wind indicator in front of your camera. Of some sort. Been doing it for almost 30 years. 20 years. Actually, 20. 20 since I started running trail cameras. About 20 years. Been starting you know, to put. I used to do it on picture, but it wasn't very, it was hard. But once yeah. the video, once the video got good. And, and Josh, the reason I did it even before trail cameras is when I was sitting at my stand, I would always hang a couple way out there just so I could watch the wind as deer came in. When I was in stand. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, uh, that's something I should ask you about, is like your setups on these scrapes, is there anything in particular um, you you can think that would, would help someone when they're setting a stand up over a scrape or is it as simple as, you know, making sure your wind doesn't get into that scrape? Uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's way more complicated uh, because we all know that wind hardly ever works perfectly, especially in the mountains. Yeah. Or hill country. Or hill country. So we got to be honest, you know, we're all got to be honest about that. So what I really target our spots if i'm going to build a mock i'm perfect i'm positioning a deer where i can get an edge wind mm -hmm. if i find a great existing scrape and i have a couple that are unbelievable i've got there's six bucks hanging behind me back in here that are off of two different scrapes and they're magnums uh yeah. over the last two decades six different bucks off of two scrapes that are still fantastic to this day that were existing, but they offered me an edge wind positioning where I could hang and hunt or tree stand or leave a stand or permanent didn't matter. I, I had a, I had a, I had a tree that was positioned with prevailing winds and thermal mixes certain times of the day that would always allow a buck to get to that scrape and think he was safe. And I'd just be off the edge of that buck's nose and be able to kill him. And that's, I really look for those edge wins. And then I hunt about like the buck I killed this year, my scent stream. And I knew it was going to happen. If he came in that morning, it didn't matter where he came to the scrape over towards where the feed was. It didn't matter. I would be able to kill him before he ever crossed my scent. And that's what happened. My scent 
I'll draw a picture here. My scent was angling down this bluff and mountain. And when he came in, he came in and my scent just missed his nose by about 10 yards and he turned and walked right up to me. And that's, that's that 10 yard window, 30 feet that I missed him. I, I, I had a hundred, I felt great. That's where he would come because of all the Intel I had on him. And it was money because he thought he was safe. Mm -hmm. He thought, he thought I had no chance of being there. Like he had no idea I was there, but he thought I had no chance of being there because if he'd have picked me up at all, he would have never walked up towards me. So it was one of those. And I do that pretty consistently, Josh, at every place I hunt. When I was in Ohio, I hung my stands daily, hang and hunt based on edge winds and had, I had so many deer walk by me, just ridiculous. Cause I'm, I'm just, I'm usually using a barrier, Josh, some type of natural barrier. It could be blow down trees. It could be a bluff. It could be a rock wall. It can be a creek behind me, something that protects me, allows me to get in, get up in a tree. And most of the deer based on the natural terrain barrier there are funneled and steered just out off of my wind, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 100% makes sense. Something else that I'm, I've been uh, really thinking about this year, everybody, I've a, a lot of guys I talk to that hunt mountainous terrain or hill country, like my buddy Johnny Stewart. I don't know if you know Johnny or not, but. Oh, I know. Yeah, Johnny's a great guy. I talked to Johnny. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, he's a big advocate of scent control too. Like he's like, man, it, in the mountains in Pennsylvania where I hunt at or wherever, you know, he hunts all over the place. But uh, he's like, he goes, it's, it's, it's tough to have the wind right all the time. And he's like, I, I try to pay attention to that. And, and I don't know, I, I often think about scent control and it's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, it's, it doesn't work. You don't have to do anything. It doesn't, you know, got to get the wind right. And that's true. But it's also like, am I just be, is that just a lazy thing to say? Because you don't want to take the extra time to, you know, do the things you were talking about, Troy, where, um, yeah, you still have to have all the wind, right. But you're also not putting this extra scent, you know, from the gas station yeah. uh, floor and but, all that, you know, I don't know but, let me, let me, let me add to that, which there's just so much that goes into this, that thanks for sparking that making me think about this. If you look at a scent cone from a biological standpoint, the amount of molecules that are in it, yeah. Every, every, every wild animal that is a prey animal has to be able to process the density of the scent molecules of a predator. And let me explain why. I'll try to make an easy analogy. Let's say a pack of wolves runs across a ridge 800 yards from one of my bucks and he barely picks up that scent molecules from them off, them off of a thermal. Or, or say they're 400 yards away. And let's say he just picks up a little profile small amount of scent molecules he processes that and knows instantly that there's wolves in the area but the amount of scent molecules that he processes stimulates a response of better keep my guard up put my head up pay attention let's say that same pack of wolves comes in on a lateral trail on a mountain right below his bed and let's say they're a hundred yards so they're out of sight and let's say it's a snowy day and he can't hear them and he can't see them. That same pack of wolves that's emitting a larger profile of scent molecules hits his nose. As soon as he picks up on that larger, higher amount density of scent molecules, his brain processes that. And just like that, he's gone because he knows that danger is real. It's no different than you and I walking by a skunk at a hundred yards or 10 feet. Yeah. We, yeah. we as humans, we as humans do it too, but we don't think about it unless it's something right next to us. Right. Cause we but don't depend we, on our nose. Well, yeah, we don't really depend on it, but yeah. I use a skunk as an analogy because think about how we all react to skunks when we're in the woods, yeah. if we're too close, get the yeah. frick out of there. If it's, if they're right yeah. next to us, like when I'm yeah. shed hunting, I've had to bail before because holy cow, I walk up on a yeah. skunk. So anyway, think of a whitetail as relating, all prey animals relate different concentrations of scent molecules as either imminent, immediate danger 
potential danger or eh, not so dangerous. So let's say as a human, it's possible to minimize the amount of scent molecules that you're putting off that are dangerous. My philosophy is, and I think Johnny's is this too, we hunt these mountains with a lot of switching winds and stuff moving around on us. And I think Johnny would agree with me, maybe not. But for me, I don't think you can ever be 100% scent free. But I believe that you can come across to a wild prey animal as being a lot further away than you really are if you're not if you're late if you're not lazy or if you just take the time to spend 10 extra minutes the way you treat your clothes the way you hang your clothes where you do it i mean all of my stuff's aired out always and it is so clean like it's refreshing to wear because it's so clean mm -hmm. i i do believe that makes sense and if you'll let me explain this year when i killed that big deer I stopped three, probably, and I've talked about it on other podcasts, but I think I stopped about three or 400 yards shy of him, of the, of the spot I killed him. I stripped down, dark night, pouring the rain, had packed in a complete new fresh set of hunting clothes. So I, I hiked in in my hiking clothes, my rain gear, and I still got soaked. Stripped everything off, put it in a grocery bag, tied it, threw it over the bank hit it just in case somebody walking through it wouldn't see my stuff. I had no idea if anybody was going to be on the mountain that day. And I could have been put all my clean clothes on that I had packed in, in the back of my backpack in Ziplocs. So it was dry, even though it poured the rain and I was soaked, got the dry clothes on completely clean. But before I put the dry clothes on, I just let myself air out for like five minutes. Mm -hmm. We're talking four in the morning, pitch dark, I just let my body air out because I had hiked up over a thousand vertical feet to kill this deer. So I did all of that, made myself get there early so I could take the time to do that, slipped up into my stand after airing out, putting on clean clothes, super clean, had that edge wind that missed that deer by 30 feet. Who's to say I kill that deer if I'm a sweaty mess and hadn't done that? Yeah. Yep. You guys are probably right. I, I uh, like I said, I've, I've, all, I've, the last couple of years, I've really been thinking about it. Like, man, is, is this just a lazy thing for me to do to, to not do those things? Um, anyway. All right, guys, if you guys, any questions for Troy, ask him away. I wanted to talk about uh, one more thing with Troy. This isn't, this is really doesn't have to do with tactics or anything, but um, <laughs> we, uh, I listened to you. I've, I've listened to numerous of your podcasts, but, you had a very interesting mentor whenever you were younger that if someone would uh, say, say, say the name, they, they're going to recognize it. But you, you've, uh, I don't know if you were close to him or not, but you, uh, you paid attention to a lot of what Mitch Rompala was doing before Mitch Rompala, his controversy kind of thing happened, right? Oh yeah. We, way before, way before all the stuff came out about the big buck mm -hmm. back in the nineties, and I really feel like this, only the guys that are like my age will really, really understand this because so much stuff has come out since then for you younger guys that I think if you would have saw and read what I read back in the old days before any of that stuff came out, you know, I was trying to find any tidbit of information about whitetail biology and how to use it against a whitetail to hunt. So I came across this book back in the 90s called Whitetail Bowhunting Masters. I read the whole thing. The guy in the book, didn't know him, had no clue who he was, read the book. The guy in the book that sparked my attention the most was a guy by the name of Mitch Rump Rumpola. And Mitch was hunting swamp deer in Michigan in this book over scrapes. And I really was intrigued by what he was doing with scrapes because I was figuring that out out here. I mean, that's where I was having my success in the nineties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know. People can say whatever they want. I just really hope, um, I really hope somebody kills a world record just so we can see, I want to see that deer get scored. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I hope Mitch watching this, somebody please kill a world record so we can get rid of that agreement he had. And let's just find out all yeah. that to say. And I mean that like, you may think I'm joking, but trust me, 
that I want to see that happen. I do. I want to see it in my lifetime. I want to see the Canadian 213 Milo Hansen buck go down. <laughs> now, I have nothing against personally against Milo at all. Right. But I, I want to see somebody kill a buck, and I hope it's a bow hunter. I really do. I hope it's a bow hunter that breaks that world record. Anyway, all that to say. So I thought way back, 90s, I'm in my 20s. And I thought, I'm going to write this guy a letter. He wrote me back. And anytime I would write him and ask him questions about scrapes, he'd write me back. And it wasn't always just about scrapes. Yeah. Mitch was, you know, I believe in what people show you and do for you in your life versus what people say about people. So Mitch was nothing but amazing to me in the 90s. But as soon as that big world record thing came out and all that controversy, and I think most people would agree with this, Mitch kind of crawled in a hole. And then, like you you and I were talking about before the, before the podcast here, uh, then all social media got huge, and now it's this big deal again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, social media blew this thing back up. But I will say this about Mitch. He always wrote me back. He was always super kind in his words. Uh, I've got multiple letters and pictures of deer he's killed over the years. And then he just, you know, I hope Kevin's watching this as son. I'll always, I'll always talk highly about Mitch because of the way he treated me. I want to see, I want to see that big buck get scored. I really do. So somebody out there needs to go out and kill a new world record so we can see it. And then let's put an end to all of it because I want to know. I mean, I would think the world wants to know. Do oh, yeah. I think, do I think Mitch gives a shit? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> but, and you got, and I want to say this. I grew up in an era where my dad threw antlers away. Yeah. Like a different mindset than what you guys are living in today and what I'm living in today. My dad would literally throw antlers in a pile and say you can't eat those yeah so the world's changed social media has sped everything up by a million miles per hour and i i, I really hope in our lifetime guys or i hope in my lifetime we get a no because i everything that i ever read or chatted with mitch about just through correspondence we were literally writing letters like pen pals uh, yeah yeah seriously <laughs> yeah. back in the old days that's all we had no yeah it was always just so kind and positive and, you know, well, and his, you know that, his, I mean, his, scra his scraping lined up with what I was seeing and doing and still do to this day, the way he hunted scrapes. That's cool. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it takes a little effort to do what you guys were doing too, right? Like now you guys could, people can Facebook message back and forth or this or that, but like to take the time to write, uh, to, you know, at the time a kid, you know, right back and forth and stuff. Yep. You know, that says something about a guy. So Yeah. I mean um, he 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 was always extremely kind and always said hi to the family and wished, you know, the boys when they were real little. Yeah. I mean just just really he didn't have to do any of that, you know? Yeah. He I, I hope the I really hope that buck gets measured one day. I really hope so. I don't think Mitch gives a crap at all, but I I'd like to see it get officially scored someday. I would. Yeah. One of my buddies was in Traverse City um, the other day, and of course you can see all property owners on Onyx now. And he he right. had some time, and he drove by Mitch's house, and he was out there uh, shoveling his driveway. And he's like, "I just I almost stopped to talk to him, but I just couldn't." <laughs> he's like, well, I felt bad. <laughs> and everybody's gonna say, "Troy, it's already been scored." What I mean is, I want that thing scored for legit, like after the agreement that was signed with him and Milo. I want that to be. Gone. gone so that we can and mitch might not allow it to be scored but i hope it i kind of hope it gets scored is what i'm saying i know it's already been scored i've talked to gary Berger online he scored it he said that thing was as real as it can get so mm -hmm. you know i have a lot of tax i have a lot of buddies that are scorers and taxidermists and I, I, all of my scoring friends out here say there's no way in hell you're going to fake them out on a fake on a fake deer you're not going to when they put their hands on it yeah. anyway, that's, and they, and they've all told me no way. So we'll see, you know, I, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to see it for the world of whitetail hunting. I would. Yeah. Yeah. It would definitely, uh, 
there you, the the world is split on that too like there's people yep. that are just dead against it and there are people that will defend him to the end yeah and it and be, it'd, it'd be an interesting day if that happened just to see I, <laughs> I try to not make any of my decisions based on emotion yeah i really try to look at it black and white uh i just think it it needs to get scored and if it doesn't yeah. we're never gonna know and i'll tell you one thing the guy was always good to me he was super nice to me again after he killed that big one though kind of just everything just kind of just kind of went away yeah yeah yep all right let's answer some questions and we'll get you off here troy uh let's see here thanks for everybody for leaving questions and everything uh Love to answer some questions. These guys that take the time to listen. Yeah. We also have a lot of, uh, we always have conversations going on, so I got to filter through. <laughs> here, here you go. Here's a fun question. Have you ever shot a deer that scores less than 10 inches? <laughs> I have. <laughs> hey. I shot, a, I shot a spike when I was in my 20s with a uh, longbow. I, it was I, a dink. <laughs> yeah. My, I love that. That's a great question. Uh when I was, when I turned 12 in Idaho, I could hunt. My dad said, you're going to have to go out and hunt on your own, son. I'm busy working. And I had hunted with my father for mule deer and elk. We used to pack 20, 30 miles in like big mountains. Anyway, when I was 12 years old, old enough to hunt, took the old 270 out, took my Irish setter, went out and killed my first white tail buck. I think he scored about 10, five yeah. inches, five inch spikes on each side. So yeah, I, that go. was my first deer that I ever killed. And yeah, he had like five, he had four or five inch spikes. So yeah, I did that. <laughs> yep. Sometimes people forget. We, we see all these guys that kill all these big bucks and it's like, it wasn't always that way, you know? No, I, di yeah. I didn't even know what a big buck, buck was till my late teens. Then I started yeah. figuring, like started seeing them at least. Right. Yep. Uh, John 91083 asked, do you like to use vines for mock scrapes? I use only what the local deer wherever i hunt use based on their preference and i find that first i scout that i find it and then i use the natural either tree or shrub species that they like the best wherever i've gone so if a deer in your area is using those vines and stuff then great uh -oh. over it i'd be all over it absolutely yep. and i've hunted a lot of different states just just because i've you know everywhere from oklahoma and ohio out west so yeah, I, I always really try to pay attention to what the deer like the best in their area. Yes. Cal says he he killed a his first longbow buck standing in a mock scrape in 1995 with a broadhead that he made. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that is cool. That's uh, awesome. Pharrell asked, how much time do you put in on creating and maintaining a mock scrape per year? I think the initial build to really sculpt it out and make it like, freaking badass and make it really work for a buck and and fool him to where he thinks it's legit i probably spend 15 to 20 minutes max and then i cast my scent really high initially up into the trees 20 30 feet high right above where the scrape is just to get the scent out because once they find the tree they find everything they need to see yeah so i do that big high cast early on the ground too, doesn't matter what month it is, put the urine in the ground too. They need to think there's residual scent in it all the time. So you build it authentic right away, 10, no, nah, 15 to 20 minutes max, get out. Then to freshen them, go in, pull a card, pack my bottles with me, touch them up with the Buck Fever Synthetics and out in, I can, you know, five minutes to touch it up and get out. If I'm hunting a big deer and really trying to be careful, I only check or refresh the scrapes that I'm hunting him over after I get out of the stand, when I leave, when I exit. Okay. Do you, uh, do you tend to hunt lower or higher in the mountains? Hunting height all is situationally dependent on the state you're in, the timber you're in. When you hunt big conifers out here, a lot of the limbs don't even start till 30 feet up. And a lot of my trees are three feet around, two feet, three feet, four feet. So I usually tend to get high out here to get some back cover and I'm fighting a lot of wind and thermal mixes that swirl. So even when I get what I consider a bulletproof wind for the mountains, that extra height with back cover and where it pushes my 
wind currents out over the top of deer and I will purposely pick terrain features that help me, I hunt pretty high. So 20 to 30 feet quite often in the mountains on big coniferous timber. I was in Ohio hunting two and three sticks for eight days. So yeah. there you go. So there you go. Okay. Like, like, please guys don't get caught up in like trends and what's cool. Yeah. Go hunt what works best for your playing field, your environment. Yeah. Well, it's it just, uh, I, I asked you that because I, I've heard guys out East, my buddy, Paul, he talks about, he likes to hunt low because it gets him underneath some of those, uh, winds that are coming off and he doesn't feel like his winds getting blown around as much in some of those tight, uh, hubs. So if, like, oh, if, that's, if that's I was something. hunting, if I hunted low out in the mountains, every deer in the world, would, I would stand out like a sore thumb on a big tree. Yeah. Cause you don't but, have cover. And the cover's not there. Plus the first 12 feet of wind in the mountains is pretty deadly to a hunter. If you're setting that low, you, you usually have to get up above and catch a different wind current. And, and the reason I say this is out here, you can walk your eyes up a tree mm -hmm. and it's where the, where the old man's beards hanging off, even the bark of the tree at 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, you'll see the wind working a little different mm -hmm. every 10 or 15 foot increment. So you, I really pay attention to that. Do a backflip. We kind of covered this already, but any advice for Ohio deer hunting? Well, I absolutely love Ohio guys, and I'm going to come back. Uh, my son Tyson and I were out there, like I said, uh, at the new year. If you're hunting hill country, I would hunt. The, I hunt those deer. I would hunt those deer exactly like I do out here in the mountains. I would play those thermals and prevailing winds on ridges. And I would catch those big bucks coming out of their beds off of these ridges. And I would catch them closer to their beds on mock scrapes. Every mock scrape we put in out there, we got the best buck on those properties, on those scrapes within three to five days, every spot. And we did not hang a spot and hunt it without throwing a quick mock in for the scent. Remember that mock scrape is a scent trap. It's a trap. You're trapping. You're trapping whitetails just like a trapper traps his animals. Yeah. We got every deer. The biggest deer that we knew of in the area from our the buddies that we were allowing us to hunt these properties, they're like, yeah, that, that deer could be there and this deer could be there. Those mock scrapes were picking those deer up within three to five days. Now, we were also throwing out some feed away from that to try to get intel too, because we had eight days. So we were playing at both just fair to your listeners. Uh, yeah, Ohio. I love it. I really like how it played out out there. And then I got to hunt flat ground too, and near the Columbus area. And it was awesome too, as far the right words are those scrapes and those setups worked exactly the same. And I was hunting edge winds and I was really trying to kill this one specific buck that I just ran out of time on a little bit. My son killed the third day. There you go. Uh, Buck Slayer asked, what's Troy's physical fitness regimen? He sounds like he covers a lot of country. Yeah, you know, guys, I'm 54, and I've had guys come out. I had a friend that come out that's a triathlete, and he elk hunted with me, and he was shocked, and it's because I've lived in the mountains my whole life. I just hike a ton. And my lungs, uh, my body's, uh, is very acclimated to walking 10 to 15 miles a day. That's what I'm doing right now on my shed days and steep, steep ground. One thing I've done is about three years ago, I started getting too heavy and I'm 5'10 and I've kind of got a stocky build. I was a running back in college. So a really good weight for me is like 190. Like that's an, a great weight for my build. I started getting too heavy and it started like I started noticing that I had I I rarely have joint pain or anything ever. And I started noticing my knees, my back, stuff starting to bother me. So since then, I've worked really hard. I'm back down around 200. My goal is to get to 190 again, like I was in college back when I was playing ball. So I'm 10 pounds away. And is I think 185, 190 as I'm getting older, maybe even 185, 180 down the road will be beneficial to me just because I'm getting older. But I walk a ton. And then behind me here, 
I just have a set of weights that I get up early in the morning and, uh, you know, the old days of playing ball, you learn how to lift and all that. I try to lift at least three days a week. And then my goal every week, like right now is at least, uh, what is it? It's at least a hundred thousand steps a week minimum. So that's do the math seven into a hundred thousand, try to get at least that many steps a day on average. And some of my weeks I get when I do those all day shed hunts, like I will this weekend, I'll have weeks that are well over a hundred thousand steps a week. And again, steep country, steep ground. Yep. Pharrell, we answer some of these questions that you're asking in the, in the, during the show. So I'm, I'm sure it got covered, but he, he must be looking for a new set of binos. What size of binos do you like? I like 10 by 42s. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, my loopholes that I have right now, I believe they are, I think they are 10 by 42s. I've had some 10 by 50s. I don't use vinyls as much as you'd think here in Northern Idaho because of the cover. But as soon as I, like I was in Montana for five days, seeing my son just recently, like last week, and we're bino and everything out there because of the openness in the river bottoms. Uh, yeah, 10 by 42 is a great size. I've, I run Vortex and loopholes is what i've ran in the you know recently bill asks how do you move deer from a historical community scrape uh, do you know of, or if you know of a historical scrape why not just hunt it yep so bill i talked about it earlier uh some historical community scrapes only have really good nighttime activity based on the surrounding conditions and pressures if I've got a target buck that's hitting that at night, I will try to usually move towards where he's coming from to address that nighttime community scrape. And I'll move towards him and throw the same thing scenario at him closer to his bedding zone. And I don't say bedding spot because my buck's bed in a big zone yeah. just to stay, to stay alive from predators. If now let's flip the script. If I find a historical community scrape that produces the caliber of buck I want to kill in the daylight, I just hunt it. And I hunt about 50% right now. My last 10 kills have been about 50-50. Historicals that are positioned so good for me, I've never had to move them. And then about 50% of the bucks I've killed in the last, I would say, 10 bucks have been where I've moved a mock community-type mock scrape right at him to get in his wheelhouse and kill him there. And then a lot of times those mocks, I position them in a better place for deer to frequent in the daylight. So then I end up getting return customers as they get older. And then I end up getting to kill great bucks like the one I killed this year at a scrape that I put in about 10 years ago for a different buck, if you will. Bill was also asking about if uh, urine turns into ammonia. Is that what the deer are smelling? Yeah. If, you know, I live in elk country, so elk really pee a lot on the ground and so do the moose. Like, it's like they yeah. pee half a gallon. Yeah. All urine, if you look at the chemical breakdown, the natural breakdown of urine, and it does it on purpose, is right after urine, like... Bill, let me back up real quick. I used to dissect every bladder of every deer to collect their urine and freeze it right after kills of mine, my buddies, my friends. I would say, please let me have the bladder to your deer. And they just thought I was nuts. And this is back This is back in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Please let me gut your deer for you. I need that urine or let me have the bladder. And they just thought I was nuts. Well, I would take a syringe. I would pull that urine out. And I would smell it and it was clean and fresh. And that's how it's supposed to smell right out of a deer. It's not supposed to smell rotten. As soon as that urine hits the ground, the natural biological breakdown of urine switches to ammonia on purpose because ammonia is a smell that will travel and carry for long distances, which allows all the other animals in the animal kingdom to pick up on it, get to it, go inspect it. Now, it really works good for deer to scrape because it allows all the deer to check on each other. It does it. Moose scrape and do the same thing. And then elk just smell like they just stink yeah, bad. You can smell them um, forever. But all that to say, it also helps the predators find those deer and moose also. Anyway, all that to say, yes, the ammonia smell is natural. 
It's one of the first stages of the breakdown to get sent to carry out long distances. Yes, it's very natural. And my synthetics all have that. My urines all have an ammonia smell to them and they work great. Not too, it can't be too crazy, too crazy ammonia, but you want a hint of that in your urine smell. What you don't want, Bill, is you don't want to use anything that smells rotten or like an outhouse. That's not natural. And that only happens in a bottle with protein-based urines that get old. Uh, Buck Slayer asked about how, uh, what, what the length is on your trail cameras for video. Like how, how long do you have your settings on for to get the data you want? Uh, minimum of 30 seconds, minimum. And, and some bucks I just love to look at, so I'll run them for a minute or more. So I'm putting 64 gig cards on some of those big deer. Yep. Do you pretty much run just regular SD card cameras out there in the mountains? Yeah, because I don't, I I don't get much cell service. Uh, yeah, over a five hundred mile circle from my house, I probably have ten spots total where I could hang a cell, and we're talking five hundred mile circle. So, I would say less than one percent of the cameras that I own in three states are cells. Less than one percent. Jay has a good question. What time of the year? Do you hunt the scrapes hardest? I've before you answer this, I've noticed you've killed some deer really early and you also kill some late season too. Yeah, I'm very proud of the fact that I hunt like I'm gonna kill deer from opening day to the end of the season, figure it out. I've worked really hard to figure it out. So I hunt my licking branches and scrapes from August 30th all the way to Christmas when it closes. And then when I go out of state in January in Ohio, still running scrapes. So the entire season. The licking branch is the key to always having deer there. The dirt really gets to rocking about mid-September, hard horn on. All right. Do you have your Do you have your first uh, buck mounted, or do you still have it? Oh, you guys are gonna hate this story. When I was 24 years old, my second teaching job, I had everything stolen from me out of my house. All my dad's guns and all my deer antlers and all my mounts. Or yeah, all my, I didn't have any head mounts back then because I couldn't afford it. Uh, I didn't think about it. It wasn't that big of a deal back in the old days. But at 24 years old, I lost everything and I had to start over. Man. Lost it all. Great. Yeah, And my dad's guns. That really bothered me. My father, my father left me with some really nice guns and they, they cleaned me out. All my sheds, everything at 24, gone. That's, uh, that's worse, getting that stolen. Yeah, didn't uh, I heard a story that I, I'm sure you know this this name Miles Keller, someone uh, he had like when he go to these shows you know and he had a, his trailer full of all of his mounts got stolen and they never found them. I've never heard that, but tell my I hope Miles is listening to this. I really I've always stayed in touch with Miles on Facebook a little bit. That sucks because I know how that feels. And yeah. Miles Miles probably had all of his stud bucks there at those shows. And I, and you know, I could be thinking of the wrong person. I'm pretty sure that's who it was that I heard well, that happen to. Whoever you just, man, that's a gut yeah. punch. Gosh, I, man. That, that's one of those days that I'll never forget in my life when I came home and all my stuff was gone off my walls. Well, those things like th those deer don't mean anything to anybody else, but you either like that, that's worth way more to, you know, to you than anybody else. So it, it's, that's a tough one. Yeah. What's your go-to boots for hiking around in the mountains? Um, I've ran two different brands. I really like the Hoffman brand. It's made right out here in Idaho. Awesome boot. The Hoffman dual double insulated pack is my pack boot with the air bob soles is awesome for mountain tree stand, whitetail hunting, where you got to walk a long ways to get to a spot to hunt and still have traction and be able to sit. I do a lot of all day sits. Mm -hmm. So be able to sit all day and not freeze to death. And then I like my, really like my crispies. Uh, what is it? The Lapon Lapua Lapona. Uh, I run those guys for all my scouting. They're they're a great little scouting boot. And I also like to archery hunt elk early season in those crispies too. So those are the two boots that are in my house. Those two brands. And I don't I don't have any affiliation yeah. with any of them. So the, those are the two that have held up the best for me. Easily performed the best for me personally. I haven't tried. Uh, either one of those. I've good. I've had good with, luck with my Lathrop and Sun boots, and then um, Zamberlins. I've had good luck with them too. 
And I've heard good stuff about those brands. Yeah, there yeah. there's so many companies now that make pretty good boots. Yep. I wore I wore Kinetrex for a couple of years too, and they were a good boot. You know, yeah. they were they were all good boots. I think I don't. I it's hard. I don't. I don't think it's a good idea to listen to anybody on boots. Like I think you need to probably go and try them on because my feet are way different than Troy's and yours. Yeah, Troy's are way different than yours. So it's kind of like a bow. Go pick yeah. the bow that you like the best that fits you the best. Uh, yeah, do everything personally to what's best for you and try stuff out. Like test stuff. I I've been a tester and an experimenter and always curious. So yeah, I've tried a lot of different things yeah. out from clothing to. So hunting know, equipment, everything. I know those guys at Lathrop and Sons. They they actually like will that they're actually feet, foot doctor or whatever that's called. That's what they they do for a living. But they have they carry it like all those brands. Me and Troy were talking about there. I think they carry all those, and they will actually like tell you what they would recommend for your foot. They'll send you like a print of your foot, and they'll they'll like my wife. You know they they sell their own boots too. But my wife, they didn't recommend their boots. They they had a Loa's or something for my wife. I can't remember what it was, but. That's uh, cool. If you're if you're in the market and want to get something um, fit for you, that may be a good option because it's hard to try those all. Like, there's not very many stores that carry a bunch of that that stuff. So, uh, here's a good. We'll do a couple more questions and we'll let Troy go. Everybody, uh, do you find bucks bed on steep steep terrain in the mountains more than in thickets for easy exit routes? Steep I find, terrain or, yeah, uh, I find. Most of my big deer, the old deer, tend to be higher in elevation, which usually equates to steep terrain. But what they'll often have is a real steep ascent and descent, like steep, steep trails and country to get to their bed. And then there'll be a tiny little bench. Sometimes it's only 15 feet around or 10 feet around. There'll be a tiny little bit of reprieve. I just found a specific buck's bed about 10 days ago out here. And I've been looking for him and I found him in the snow based on his track and the size of the bed. Finally found where he was bedding. He's going to be nine years old next year. My son and I have had a history with this deer like you wouldn't believe. But he was on steep, steep, steep ground. And I found him. I had a perfect inch of fresh snow where he's still bedding right now. Very close to a mock community scrape that I have built for him that we've almost killed him there twice. And I've missed him there once. And that was just for the record. It's my only miss in the last decade. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, guys, yes, real steep tends to be higher elevation, heavy cover. And the bucks like that because of the th daily thermals. When they're bedded, they got an uphill thermal. That just makes sense. But they usually can just bail back over, get up and over a ridge pretty quick or head out a lateral trail or go straight down. So they can go any direction they want based on danger. and. Again, they like the steep because of the positioning with the thermals and the wind. And most people don't want to climb up into real steep country. You know, the predators will, but it gets them away from humans for sure. Down low in thickets, I rarely find a mature, high caliber mountain type buck down low because that's where all the that's where all the human intrusion is. That's where all the trailheads are. Uh, that's where all the horseback riders are. That's where all the ATVers are. Uh, that's where the, just where there's a lot of human intrusion. I don't have much luck down low. No. All right, Troy, that was our last question. Thanks man for getting on here. You bet. Thanks for having me. I think we learned a lot. Where can everybody, I, I, I left your Instagram and your YouTube channel link below. Yeah. And then, then guys, I, uh, yeah, just real quick. Thank you. Uh, MTN underscore man 33, mountain man 33. If you want to talk anything hunting related to me, uh, if you want to touch weight base with me about the scent that I use and that, that I mix and put together. And then if anybody's interested in one of my boot camps, find me on Instagram because I usually do three to four of those a year out West. And I've had guys come from as far as Oklahoma to my boot camps. And then my YouTube is just, I'm going to start really working on that. It's kind of, it's just videos, basically a bucks. It's not blowed up or it's not like, I don't put a lot of time into it yet, but I'm going to like, it's coming. And then whitetail addictions guys, please. If you get a chance, check out the whitetail addictions guys. I film for them. I hunt for them. The buck that we talked about on here, that that footage actually is getting shipped out tomorrow to get produced for this spring or for this uh, summer. 
And then, of course, I run all the Lone Wolf custom gear stuff. Awesome. A lot of people are saying that it was Miles that got 20 mounts stolen in Texas. Good Lord. Yep. I, I've, uh, ne I've, I've never heard that story. So yeah. that's cool. That's cool uh, to find out that it was legit, but it's terrible that it happened to Miles. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for getting on here. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Yep, you too.